All right, welcome to this week's episode of OKCoin OK Live. My name is Natalie Brunel, and I'm super excited to be joined by John Vallis, host of the Bitcoin Rapid Fire podcast and an author and just an all around great guy in the space. So, John, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Natalie. It was good to uh, connect with you a few weeks back in Oslo and looking forward to a chat. Well, I'm excited to get to know you a little bit better and we don't have to do, you know, a full origin story and get too much in the weeds, but I just wanted to hear and have the listeners hear a little bit more about your background, sort of where you're from, a little bit maybe about your career journey and ultimately how you came to discover Bitcoin. Sure. Well, I'll try to be brief. I'm from Newfoundland, represent originally in the, on the East coast of Canada. And I left home uh, when I was 21. 20, 21, 22, right after university. And I got a one-way ticket. Well, I actually, I did four months backpacking around South America, and then I got a one-way ticket to Shanghai in China. And wow. I wanted to go there because I felt that Shanghai would be like going to New York in the early 1900s, you know, kind of the center of the, the, center of the emerging world. And, uh, you know, opportunity and riches and that whole thing. And uh, I wanted to be involved in finance somehow. So I went there as luck would have it. I ended up getting a job in, in wealth management and I did that for uh, three years and uh, really hated it. You know, like it just the the whole industry, I kind of knew I, I'd wanted to be in finance since I was a teenager. But my experiences over the, the following few years had kind of made me rethink priorities in life. But I had this like lingering dream of wanting to do this thing. And even though I was kind of already changing my tune on it, I was like, I just got to give it a whirl. And so I went and did it and I kind of confirmed my, the reasons why I was changing my, my, uh, you know, priority or my ambitions. And so I left that after three years and then I went back to school. I did a three year, uh, degree in natural medicine. And then I went back to Shanghai and I was, I was in Shanghai for a portion of that, uh, went back to Shanghai and worked at a clinic there in that capacity. And wow. for a number the the work I enjoyed more because health and wellness has always been like an interest of mine. And I think it's really important and it's more gratifying in many ways than just getting people to give you their money so that you can take a commission off it. Um, but I didn't like the clinic and the, the landscape in China was very, very like financially and profit oriented. And obviously that's a part of it, but it was just way over the top for me. And so after nine years in uh, China between Shanghai and Beijing, I ended up uh, just being like, I need some time away. And so I went, uh, I bought a motor home and traveled around Europe for four months wow. with the, uh, you might like this, with the kind of just spontaneous idea, like I'm going to buy a motor home, drive around. And whenever I meet interesting people, I'm just going to welcome them into the truck and record, you know, like a podcast. And oh, really? Yeah. It are didn't these, work out. Are these episodes up? Can we find they, them? They were. They were. They might be somewhere. I, 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 they, I had a separate YouTube channel, but when I like became, no. began focusing purely on Bitcoin, I, I don't know if I removed it or deleted it. They're around somewhere. I, I'll get, I'll get them to you someday. But That's the cool. punchline was, first of all, there's way cooler environments than recording inside a truck when you're in like some amazing European, you know, town. So we ended up doing them outside the car and it didn't go as planned, but I, I think I did like 20 or 25 over the course of, of three months. And so it was a fun experience. And then I, just, I moved to Thailand because Thailand's always where I've gone when I just wanted to clear my head and, and recenter. And then I met my partner there and then COVID happened and the rest is kind of history. And, all, and then wow. I guess the, the Bitcoin relevant stuff is uh, had been interested in Bitcoin for a long time, really was a critic of the, the financial system and the monetary system. So I had been keeping an eye on it. And in 2014, I was in Bali and I finally, there was a physical store there because at that time, like buying Bitcoin was kind of a complicated task. And I was like, oh, great. You know, now I can finally get some Bitcoin. And then, you know, as you know, it just snowballs from there. And then when I was in Thailand in 2019, I, you know, at that point I was basically obsessed with Bitcoin and I needed a way to kind of like exercise that obsession and talk to people in the space. And so I figured a podcast was a good re a good way to, of doing that. That is so fascinating. I love how much you've traveled. And, you know, one of the things I've always really liked about you from afar and getting to know you is you just seem so down to earth. You can tell that you're not in this space for the profits. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you because did you appreciate Bitcoin because you learned about the problems in our monetary system from your finance background? And why did you even go into that 
you know, that space? Were you interested in like money or stocks? Yeah, I mean, when I was a, like when I was in high school, I was reading all the classical investment books, you know, like uh, Security Analysis by Ben Graham, that gigantic, boring, you know, book and, and Phil Fisher and, you know, uh, Peter Lynch and all that kind of stuff. Um, so basically, I, I wanted to be rich and I figured, well, being in managing money is the way you get rich, right? Why and, did you um, want to be rich? This is, it feels so. Well, different who doesn't want to? Who doesn't want to be rich? at some, you know, a lot of it's a yeah. pretty common ambition, okay. right? And, and but but you know, the reason was because I did I didn't want to have limitations in my life. You know, I wanted to be able to pursue whatever option it was that I desired decided I want to pursue. Um, so it, it wasn't in school that I I learned that. You know, I'd always been a very independent kind of studier, and through all the books I'd read and YouTube videos and stuff, I'd just come to appreciate the the flaws in our current monetary system. Um, we Go good? Ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the flaws in the current monetary system. And, um, but I, I, like I said to you, like I kind of shelved them, even though I had those misgivings, I was like, eh, I, I've been thinking about this dream for so long. Like, I feel like I at least have to give it a whirl, you know, the old mm -hmm. college try. And, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, my, my, my criticisms of, criticisms of it were, you know, kind of overcame any ability for me to engage in it, you know, as to apply myself fully to it. And so, you know, that's part of the reason why I, I withdrew from it. And also part of the reason why when Bitcoin came on the scene, I was a gold bug at that time. And wow. I thought separating money and, and that was just kind of like, a, what else are you going to do but become a gold bug before Bitcoin if you're a critic of the monetary system? But it's a really like, it's not a very hopeful uh, position to take because you're basically hoping your thesis is that everything's going to melt and hopefully someone will take some of my yellow rocks when it does. And that's not a very hopeful position to take. And then when Bitcoin came on the scene, I, I saw it as a way to separate money and state. And I saw it far more as a political uh, instrument than an investment instrument when it first came. I just wanted it to exist. But of course, in the early days, I didn't think that it had that much of a hope. And then as it continues to survive, you think, oh, wow, it has a chance. It has a chance until mm -hmm. you get to a point where like this thing can't be stopped. And that's, you know, where you kind of go over the event horizon and become a full blown laser eyed Bitcoiner, you know? Well, so was there a point where you had maybe an aha moment that spurred you to have really great conviction in Bitcoin and believe that it could actually be the thing that solves a lot of the problems in the financial system? Because, I, you know, everybody's Bitcoin rabbit hole journey is so different. So was there a moment for you that you remember that was that changed you? Not really. I think it, you know, and I know it's not a super exciting answer, but I think things just stack up over time. And as you continue to educate yourself, you know, and like so many others, the Bitcoin standard was a very, uh, mm -hmm. you know, powerful book for me as well. But as it, as it stacks up and as that coincides with Bitcoin surviving, it just, you just get to the point where, you know, maybe you're lying in bed one night or maybe you're out for a run. And you just realize, hold on now, if this thing can't be stopped and if it really has these amazing monetary attributes and it is actually increasing in its ad adoption and distribution and all that kind of stuff, like, well, what is the kind of seemingly inevitable outcome there? Mm -hmm. And it seems like the inevitable outcome is that it ultimately becomes global base money. And, yeah. you know, then we get, and then you start to imagine like, well, what are the implications of that? You know, because mm -hmm. one of the things that's so fascinating about being on this journey of understanding money, let's say, is that you begin to understand how uh, influential the money is to the society and the culture and the civilization and, and, and the institutions mm -hmm. in those cultures and how like it how it incentivizes a variety of different behaviors, both good and bad, depending on the monetary medium. And, you know, once you start to appreciate the extremely unique attributes that Bitcoin has, then you start to think, like, OK, well, Let's. It may not happen for a while on mass, but when it does, when this is base money, what kind of a civilization or what kind of a culture is that going to foster now that we are able to basically remove or prohibit corruption on the base layer and allow for more pristine signals to be sent between one another in a society mm -hmm. and eliminate the degree of theft that currently takes place and all those things that we often talk about, what kind of a society does that elicit? And that's the really exciting part. And that's where the, the element of hope comes in that we so often hear about in this space is because you begin to see how this instrument translates into a future that is, you know, amazing, right? That we, we, have, a we have a difficult time articulating. And we always want to try to measure our, 
our excitement and our enthusiasm and our hopefulness. You know, we want to make sure that it's real and we're not just deluding ourselves. And mm -hmm. that's why this space is like one of the things I love about this space is there's such a willingness to like get on the battlefield of ideas and hash it out. Even if, you know, who cares about hurt feelings? Who cares about name calling? Whatever. Let's just figure yeah. out what the truth is. And I think that's led mm -hmm. to one having a very resilient uh, ecosystem of like trying to punch holes in these arguments to see if they are act they actually hold up. But two, yes. because they so often do, is that it just increases that like your image of what lays on the horizon as a result of this thing existing and succeeding because it, it's seemingly increasingly inevitable and all the different ways that it's going to ameliorate things become more and more apparent to you over time until you just, again, you become mm -hmm. kind of consumed with what it means, you know, on so many different, in so many different domains. Oh my gosh. I, I can't agree with you more. I, I think this space is so full of really rich ideas and the qualities of Bitcoin permeate into so many different aspects of life and society and politics and all of it that I love to think about. And so I actually want to ask you, this isn't technically a Bitcoin question, but with you kind of traveling and, and, you know, allowing people to come in and talk to you about their walks of life, their backgrounds. It reminds me of the show that Anthony Bourdain did, you know, where he's just kind of across the table, just finding common ground. Are there any uh, maybe takeaways or, or really memorable threads that would apply to why you believe in Bitcoin just from, just from the stories you heard from people across Europe? That's an interesting question. Um, I think inevitably the answer is yes. And part of that is just that, you know, we're in the Bitcoin space, we're pretty critical of like people that don't see it yet, you know, normies or fiat people or, you know, whatever pejorative we we put on them. And it's, you know, there's a playful element to it. So it's not, you know, I don't think people are really trying to be that mean most of the time. Um, but it, there, it's a pretty big distinction between someone who sees what's going on and sees a viable solution and someone who doesn't, especially in the highly polarized world that we have today. And what traveling and meeting people and the variety of experiences I've had in my life has helped me to appreciate. And what I try to remember is that most people are, are good if you let them be, or if you can, you know, if you can speak to the good in them, if you can invite that out of them through your interactions with them, most people are good and want to be good. It's just a lot of times people's problems overcome them and they end up being a version of themselves that they're not particularly proud of, or they wouldn't choose to be all things being equal, or they're placed in a state of uh, artificially severe deprivation as a result of the socioeconomic system that they're, they're living within, that they had no choice in themselves. And so meeting so many people and, and talking to them, um, I feel like I, I, and being so random about it, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one of the stories that comes to mind as I was on Lake Garda in Northern Italy. And mm -hmm. I was just tr like driving around trying to find like a parking lot to spend the night. Right. And so I like, I, I find this parking lot and there's another guy with like a camper van there and I get out and I go for a swim in the thing and I come back and I see him, he's meditating like close to his car. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Don't often see that. And then the next day, you know, I go for a swim again. And, and as I go down, he's like playing guitar and singing to himself like next to his car. And then I came back up and I was like, you know, I might as well ask this dude if he wants to, you know, have a chat. And he was like studying, lying down just uh, with like an audio uh, language learning thing on. And he was kind of like a hippie yoga sort of looking dude. Anyways, I just went up to him and said like, hey, dude, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just driving around. And when I meet interesting people, I ask them if they want to have a chat. And he was like, oh, OK, sure, whatever. And um and we had a really nice chat and he, 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 it's amazing. Like when you're, once you get over the hurdle of proving to people, you're not a psychopath in certain, in, in these sorts of uh, environments, it's amazing how much they open up and they tell you, you know, about their life and they tell you about the challenges they've encountered. They tell you about the things they've learned. And I would always want to get from people, um, those things exactly like, you know, kind of not in so many words, but who are you, what are you about and what is it, what experiences have shaped you and, and what kind of, learnings or, or wisdom have you drawn from those experiences? And um, so, you know, that's kind of what I always try to do in that. And that's also the thing that's the, the aspect of this whole Bitcoin phenomenon that's most interesting to me, you know, like I appreciate 
and enjoy intellectually the economic and the financial and the monetary discussions that are had, the macro stuff, because it's so, uh, it's so alive and pertinent and, and relevant today. But mm-hmm. it's like, it's also, I get it, you know, and, and if you're all in on Bitcoin and you kind of see you kind of see it, then how much does all that really change your behavior? And I, I would say probably not much. But the thing that I've focused a lot of my discussions on has been speaking to people and just trying to ascertain how engaging in Bitcoin, learning about Bitcoin, seeing what kind of a future that it may help to foster, how has that changed them as people? And the responses yeah. have been like absolutely astonishing to the point where you know, now because I'm kind of known for that angle on this thing, Mm -hmm. when I go to, you know, something like the Bitcoin conference, people come up to me all the time just to tell me their story about what it is. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, so often the story goes something like this. And this was my story too, you know, like you, you come up in the world, if you have any curiosity about how the world works and you really drive down and try to understand it, most often you come away with the impression, oh fuck, things are fucked. Can I swear on this? Yeah. Um, Maybe they can bleep it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll I'll use other language. But you know, you 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 study the world, and if you keep you know kind of pursuing that, you come away with the impression that things are really messed up in the world, and it seems like they're so messed up that you it's not going to be possible to overcome them. Sure, you can still have like a meaningful life as an individual, but on a macro level, like how do we rectify so many of these problems? And that can cause you to feel despair and be despondent and be frustrated and and feel alienated and you know withdraw from the world in many different ways and as you know and that might just take the form of you being a loner and focusing on your own stuff but for many people who actually care who want to be to want to have the world reflect the goodness that they feel in, inside of them to be a little bit cheesy yeah. but i think that's somewhat true is uh they 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 kind of self-destruct in many ways, right? And so whether Mm -hmm. it's substance abuse or whether it's poor relationships or whether it's not taking care of their health properly, like things spiral downward. And when you, when you confront Bitcoin, when you begin to understand it, when you begin to see how influential money is to all other things, and then how, how much this money can help to rectify so many of those things that previously you thought were irreconcilable, that couldn't be fixed, then you start to say, Hey, instead of the future being like some dark mess of garbage that I don't want to be a part of and that I don't have any hope for, now it's something bright and hopeful that I actually really want to be a part of. And if I want to be a part on it, a, a part of it in the best way possible, I need to fix, I need to optimize my own stuff, you know? So yeah. I'm inspired now to take care of myself, to, to have better relationships in my life, to try to educate myself so I'm able to engage in a career or work that's more meaningful to me, all these different things. And once you pile those on, you end up just becoming a healthy, well-adjusted, hopeful, awesome person. And what do you know, when we go to conferences like, you know, the Bitcoin conference in Miami, or whenever you hang out with Bitcoiners, you look around, you're like, yeah, I mean, those are those types of people. Those are people that are really engaged, that are really working towards a common cause, that have a lot of shared values, and that are, you know, are more happy and satisfied and content than oftentimes they were prior in life. And to me, this is the emerge. We talk about how influential money is on the broader culture. To me, this is the very early, you know, example, like the initial cohort of what this culture is going to look like when it's on a Bitcoin standard. And all Mm -hmm. of us early Bitcoiners, and I'm not trying to toot our horns too much, but I think you look around what, what culture is emerging around Bitcoin and I think you get a window into seeing what culture will be like when w- the whole world is on a, on a Bitcoin standard. It'll be a lot more complex and there'll be a lot of differences, but you get like that little taste of what it might be like. And it's very encouraging. And, and that's why I like mm-hmm. to investigate that aspect of things more than anything else. I couldn't agree more. Everything you're saying just resonates with me so much. And I found that hope is such an essential part of the human experience and you know, one of the things that I think a theme in your your writing Money Messiah tackled was this idea that w- money can actually build walls between us, right? And it could be a barrier. But now we have something that's coming out that has sort of providence to it and all these beautiful 
attributes that almost flip, you know, greed on its head and and change the changes the incentive program. So for people that aren't familiar with Money Messiah, can you talk a little bit about it, what inspired it, and just sort of what your message is? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a very piece... complicated text <laughs> that I had to read a little a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's 40 pages and it's I mean, I guess it's it, it's where I'm currently at in my thinking about all this because you can money money touches everything, right? Because money is yeah. at the end of the day an expression of value and it's a means by which you move through, you know, the socioeconomic world. And so it it has relevance almost everywhere. And mm-hmm. so when you're trying to understand what Bitcoin is, you end up having to understand all the different things that money touches or is related to, which is to say, damn near everything. And then Mm -hmm. as a layer on top of that, when you're dealing with something that is completely novel, and I think Bitcoin falls into that category, then you're not only dealing with now I have to learn about how, uh, how things are, but you also have to kind of stretch your imagination to say, well, how could things be, you know, how, how does this thing cause us to reimagine how things are going to change from the current state. And, um, you know, and, and Bitcoin, the rabbit hole goes very deep, as I think, you know, you're probably, you probably know and many others. And this was my attempt to distill my current thinking on the matter. And weirdly, I know, you know, this will sound weird to a lot of people, but it ends up getting into some pretty kind of perhaps unexpected territory where we start talking about, you know, deep philosophical notions and even theological and religious ideas that are somehow wrapped up with money and in particular a money like Bitcoin that is so pristine that, you know, that doesn't Mm -hmm. violate itself and that allows you to not have your wealth become violated. And what, Mm -hmm. again, what is the meaning of, of those attributes and what is the meaning of engaging them and what, and what is the, and I guess a lot of this is, is the genesis of, a lot of the thoughts from that piece is I was trying to figure out too, why is this thing having such a transformative, but positive effect on so many people? Like you don't encounter that many things in life that have such a positive transformative effect on people at scale. And, you know, so I don't know how much you want me to try to summarize the piece, but basically I, I, I delve as deeply as I possibly can into the notions and concepts of, value and meaning and truth and freedom. And I try to explore, explore how they're all wrapped up in Bitcoin and potentially represented in their highest form, as it were, mm-hmm. you know, and, and how Bitcoin is a representation of some of these highest values and ideals that, again, are, are talked about in philosophy and theology and religion yeah. all throughout the ages, which are the ideas of truth and freedom and love and you know, when we find those ideas in their highest form, we end up kind of sacralizing them. They become, mm-hmm. we kind of revere them. We kind of devote, there's a certain devotion ascribed to them. And it seems to me that Bitcoin is another representation of those values and ideals, perhaps in their most pristine form ever. And this is why it's, this may be why it's having such a, a uh, influential, it's, it's having such a strong influence on people. Well, what do you say to people out there who maybe with a negative connotation say Bitcoin is a religion or it's a cult? I mean, my first question would always be like, what What do you mean? What is a religion? What is a cult? What do you mean by those words? Because I don't know what you have. In, it, it, does cult mean like, you know, you all get together, sing Kumbaya, drink the poison Kool-Aid and, you know, everyone's dead, and, you know, the next day? <laughs> you know, is that that kind of a cult? Um, and also... I mean, all, most religions start as cults, right? Even Christianity was a, a, a cult in, you know, in the, like the early Roman world, for example, and it had to be practiced in secret and all that kind of stuff until it ascended to the dominant form of, you know, spiritual religious belief. Um, but again, I think that's a great question and I, I don't have any definitive answers, but what I try to explore in the piece is, is basically that question. Why are people treating it like that? Why does it seem to be having an influence that's somewhat akin to a religious belief? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not just because people are stupid and religious is a dumb superstition and, you know, that's just how the world works. The the answer is answer is much deeper and much more complicated than that. And I think it's I think it's I think there's almost nothing more deserving of investigating that 
relationship in particular, because as we've seen throughout history, say what you will about uh, religious institutions, and I, I'd be with you if you if you were critical of how they've acted over the last several thousand years, but religious ideas have been with us since the dawn of recorded civilization. I mean, you can even go back to, you know, 40 plus, 100 plus thousand years ago, and the earliest human representations were religious iconography. And so there's there's something integral to how we perceive the world and how we engage the world that is wrapped up in what we now call religious beliefs. But again, I think what that means is just like, what are the values that we use to most orient us, you know, so that we can have the most optimal orientation for our own lives and a harmonious collective or social life. And if we can identify certain values or principles that allow us to optimize on those domains, what does it say about this reality, Mm -hmm. this environment that we're in, that those particular values are what optimize uh, our experience of life? And it might be the case that that might suggest that somehow this reality that we're experiencing, or at least how our consciousness experiences it, somehow values or prioritizes or is parameterized by what we you what the, the the words we use the concepts for which we the words we use are truth and freedom and love and 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 these sorts of yeah. things and so again like it, it's it's a lot to cover in a in a short right. description but the punchline is i think people are coming to <clears throat> re- realize that what, what we may be confronting something of such extreme value that it ascends to the domain of like the highest value considerations that that sure. we've always been wrestling with. And I think we wrestle with them because we recognize that gaining greater clarity on them is what fosters a, a more meaningful life. And I think ultimately right. that's what we're all after. No, completely. You know, it's, it's a really fascinating piece of writing. And I think that Bitcoin is almost, to me, it's almost like a form of enlightenment. And it casts this light on all these different things when you learn about it, right? And it feels like the people that don't understand it yet, like they're in sort of this cloud of darkness or they're not awake to it. And and it's beautiful to see sort of the the bubbling up of, of awareness and education. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the most maybe underappreciated or undervalued quality or aspect of Bitcoin? Hmm. Well, I mean... I think it's it's probably the one that most Bitcoiners value greatly, perhaps more so than any aspect of it, but that still the broader world doesn't, and that's freedom. I mean, I, I think that's what Bitcoin is all about, is freedom. Freedom to not be stolen from, freedom to to transmute your life force, your work, everything of value that you're able to uh, render to the world to transmute that into a form of intersubjective value that nobody can dilute or take from you. And the benefit of that is that that maximizes your optionality in the world so that you can go out into the world and pursue the things that you find the most meaningful with the greatest capability. And that's what a, a pristine, inviolable money does. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's miraculous because what does that, you know, Bitcoin is a means, right? It's not an end. And, and the end is all of us, trying to live the best life we can as the best version of ourselves that we can we can develop or that we can step into something like that mm-hmm. and the fact that bitcoin is permitting us to do that is amazing and so and i think it does that by virtue of the fact that it allows one to be sovereign to be free to be liberated from you know the theft and the encroachment and the the the, the distortion that the current monetary system exacts on people. Mm -hmm. And once we have a a system where people are not only totally in control of their wealth, but all the different signals that are occurring in a, in a market, let's say are pristine, there's no distortion in those signals from one person to another. So, you know, the, my values can be directly imbued into the market without any distortion. And then the market can deal with them as it will. I think what it means is we get to, we really get to find, well, I think we really get to see what everyone is made of. And I also think that gives us the opportunity, though not the guarantee, that we get to see how good the world can be when people are able to freely make decisions and when people have the, the optimized or maximal capacity to express themselves and to actualize their, their highest selves, something like that. And so I think that's still 
greatly underappreciated in the broader world because, you know, most people don't even think this is a viable form of money, let alone something that's going to permit that degree of, you know, personal change, development, aspiration, ambition. Have you read the book, uh, Seat of the Soul? Nope. A lot of the themes that you're talking about, they're, they're discussed and kind of analyzed in that book. Preston Pish gave it to me. Anyway, I recommend it. It's, it's really good. It, it talks a lot about these things and it was written before Bitcoin existed, but it's just very, very interesting. Um, cool. Well, let's talk a little bit before we wrap up about the macro picture, because I know someone like you and you've been in it for a while, you're probably not as concerned about this short-term volatility that we're seeing, but a lot of people out there are. They're worried about the price. They're worried how much further it could fall. Just any takes on what's been happening with the Fed trying to raise interest rates, how much debt there is in the system, and all of this kind of you know, really putting pressure on Bitcoin, especially because there are so many companies that have liquidity issues or they have leverage. And, uh, and, and really, you know, it might be a nice entry point for some people, but for others, they feel a little bit worried. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. I, I've I've basically reached Zen at this point because you know <laughs> when you're all in and you know you custody your own funds. Yeah. I mean, what does all of this matter other than allowing you to scoop up some more on the cheap for your your dollar cost averaging? But um, you know, I, with all this stuff, this was always what we expected. You know, in in Bitcoin land, we've been talking about this event for a while. I mean, the, the fiat unwind has to occur. And is this the last hurrah or can we kick it down the road another time or another several times? I mean, it seems unlikely, but, you know, if this is part of the the unwind that has to take place, uh, it's it's all kind of expected, you know, like, of course, on a if we if we dial in that the Fed has backed themselves into the corner into a corner and it seems like there's no easy way out. And I get concerned, one, because the transition was always the concern, like, untethering from the fiat world and going on to a Bitcoin standard, it, it, it always seemed like that was not going to be possible without some some pain, you know, and I don't think we've even started to experience that yet. And I really hope I'm wrong in that, but it just, I, I don't see many other options. Um, and, you know, the current fiat unwinds or the what's happening in the markets right now, what, what gives me concern is that I think as fiat unwinds, the lines between monetary policy and and fiscal policy and government action and geopolitics will become very blurred. And so, you know, as a, as a simple example, right now, like the Fed, if they don't want to raise rates, they, they are a little bit right. But raising rates too high would put them in a very uh, difficult position. They want to quell inflation. You know, I think something like demand destruction but by other means starts to enter the picture, you know, in those, mm -hmm. wherever those conversations are taking place and whether it's, you know, that circumstance kind of allows uh, demand destructive scenarios to arise, or even if they're instigated, you know, I don't know, and I'm not a big conspiracy person, but I just, we're entering a, a, a period where people that have been in control of this system for so long are going to become more and more desperate as they try to hold things together, as they try to maintain their grip of, of control on all this. And I think that means that there's going to be, I, I, I think uh, in their desperation, there's going to be uh, actions that we're probably going to be extremely critical of as, as people that prioritize freedom and liberty and honesty and self-determination and all that kind of stuff. And so, that being said, you know, Bitcoin is the only life raft that I can I, I can really see, you know, developing adaptability and resilience and independence in other areas of your life so that whatever pot, whatever happens and wherever it happens, you know, the more independent you are, the better. And whether we're talking about food or energy or location or the community that you have and all that kind of stuff, I think that's going to be very helpful. But that all takes time and that's a bit more challenging. But with Bitcoin, I mean, the nice, the, the bright orange life raft is right there. And <laughs> people that are, are thinking about the volatility and when should I get in and all this kind of stuff, they're, they're missing the point. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in my opinion, it's there. And if you want to save yourself, if you want to save your family, if you want to insulate your, not only insulate yourself from what's to come, because as you alluded to, Bitcoin is still a small drop in a big ocean. And so it, it feels the gyrations that occur there. But it's the only place 
where you don't have any counterparty risk, counterparty risk, where you cannot be stolen from. And so you can park your wealth there and you know it's going to be there for you in the future. And in this environment where basically nothing is going to be safe from dilution, confiscation, regulation, all that kind of stuff, that is a massive, massive benefit. And I think people should be looking at it more in those terms rather than the U.S. dollar exchange rate. You know, what's interesting that is happening, I think, right now on a macro picture, just with human relationships and experiences, is I feel like, especially with social media, we're just, we are in these tribal buckets and we have our echo chambers and people don't just sit down and have a conversation, which is why I love, you know, shows like yours and other big podcasters out there. They're trying to have these conversations and maybe bridge some of these controversial topics and see if there's there's some common ground between two sides. But for the most part, we just lump ourselves into these categories and 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 people don't seem to get along and in fiat I feel like there's a constant power struggle there's always hierarchies and power struggles and this this person has power over this person this country has power over that country um you know money obviously being a form of power do you think that there's still going to be these types of power struggles on a bitcoin standard or how would it change yeah again it's a, a super interesting question which I think about a lot you know how will how will govern governance or the political apparatus change when, you know, for one, theft is not so easy, you know, because so many of governments are so many governments today are funded through the money printer. And that's basically just the debasement of all the outstanding money in the system. And they get the ability and the right to allocate it uh, as a result of that. Um, and so how does how does governance change when that's no longer the case? But as you say, I mean, I think whatever the issue is, whatever, whatever side of the aisle you're on, it's like, it's not even that people want the issue resolved most of the time. It's they want the power to make the decision, you know? So to your point, it, you don't get many open dialogues where people are honestly and earnestly trying to, you know, find common ground and then, and then, you know, find a solution to a problem. Basically what all the ranting and raving boils down is you have more power than me and I want the power. Because then I get to do what my ideology is, what's consistent with my ideology. And both yeah. sides are saying the same thing. And obviously the difference is on, is, is on the ideology, not on the way of the imbalance of power that allows it to be imposed on people, which right. I think we would agree is ultimately the problem. And Bitcoin does, to a large extent, resolve. So I, I think it's too early to tell what politics and governance looks like uh, on a Bitcoin standard. But I mean, the trend seems clear is that when people are more and more independent, when they can no longer be stolen from, when they have more wealth and as a result options in their life and they can move jurisdictions or they can move countries or they can go where they're being treated best, where their their freedom is is more highly regarded and they have more benefits and all that kind of stuff, you're going to see a far more rapid shift in all this stuff. And I, I think you will get uh, competition between jurisdictions playing out because now you become more of a customer than a serf, basically, you know, to use... I don't think actually that dramatic a language, but when sure. when people that presume to offer you services and want to quote unquote govern you when they, when, when they want to have that right, uh, when they can't steal from you any longer, they have to uh, get money from you the only other way, which is providing you a valuable good or service. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see like an explosion in jurisdictional arbitrage and competition over the coming decades. And I think that's really good because when you invite competition into something, you usually get a far better product product. And I think that's going to be the case for governments. What it means for like, you know, huge superpower nation states and all that kind of stuff. You know, who knows? I Again, I, I, I hope that we can our better judgment will help us see through it in the most peaceful and, and le uh, least damaging way possible. So we shall see. Okay, well, John, I feel like you're on this constant quest for truth. So what are you looking into right now? What are you reading? What are you curious about? Tell us. You know, I, I feel the same way. And it, sometimes I feel like it's kind of like an indulgent quest um, because, you know, there are other things in life too. But to me, you know, the re what we've been discussing, you know, why this is having such an effect on people, why it's transforming people, why people are finding it so meaningful that is the biggest burning question in my mind. You know, like I just, I want to know more about why that is. And the reason why I feel that is that that question and pursuing that question and pursuing greater clarity on that question is, is such a worthwhile use of time is because 
I think the more we can appreciate what's going on, the more we can intentionally and consciously engage in it. And I think if we really are dealing with something of such great uh, meaning and potential impact, then the more we can understand it, the more we can invite it into our lives to improve our lives and to help others do the same. And so um, as a result of that, I'm, I'm working on another piece of writing, which is basically you know, uh, putting more meat on the bone of the Money Messiah piece that you mentioned a little while back. Um, and so I don't know if that'll be a book or not yet. It's kind of seeming like it will because it's super lengthy already. And it's going to be, um, yeah, it's, cha- it's, it's challenging because I am swimming in the waters of those like fundamental philosophical and theological questions and then trying to relate it to money and Bitcoin and consciousness. So smashing all the big uh, questions into one and trying to come up with something that's not uh, gibberish. And to do that, I've been reading uh, a ton lately, which has been awesome. I've been reading John Stuart Mill on Liberty. I've been reading Manly P. Hall. I've been reading the Federalist Papers, Plato, Plotinus, and uh, a bunch of others. And I should probably get better at like finishing a book before I start another, but I just like, I'm reading like eight (laughs) books right now, but it's awesome. I never thought this is what I'd be doing with my time, you know, uh, five or 10 years ago. But again, there's there's nothing more gratifying than uh, being involved in Bitcoin and, and meeting yes. all the other people that are involved and figuring out why it's so meaningful to you and then contributing in the way that seems most uh, worthwhile and most enjoyable to you. And so that's kind of been my focus lately. Yes. Isn't the unpredictability of life so great? Yeah, I am well, excited. You know, serendipity is a real thing in Bitcoin. You know, it, it is. It, it's probably a real thing in life, but it, it gets... It seems to get amplified in Bitcoin it's just all the time, nonstop. Completely. Well, I am looking forward to reading your next writing whenever you finish it. And to wrap up, we're going to do the little tradition that we have at OK Coin, uh, which is to ask you, OK or not OK? I'm going to throw out some terms or things or themes, and you're going to say, OK or not OK? Um, OK. This, this bear market. OK. I love it. More, more Bitcoin for less fiat. I knew you'd say that. Uh, NFTs. Not okay. <laughs> uh, inflation. Not okay. Theft. Should uh, <laughs> Everyone should be disgusted by it. Carnivore diet. Okay. I like a little fruit, <laughs> but it's basically added in, but it's basically what I do too. Uh, pineapple on pizza. Totally not okay. An abomination. My family's in the pizza business. This is just horrible. Can't happen. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much, John. Where can people find you and follow you and support your work? Uh, the best place is, is Twitter. Uh, my handle is at John K. Vallis and all the other destinations they can probably find from there. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of OKCoin OK Live with John Vallis. Yep. Natalie, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure.